uh, history. I get a lot of geography. And we get to share a lot of things. Several months ago, after Roger was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, we were going on the road and to the, to the service, and he said, I've got a message I need to tell. He said, I don't know what it is yet. And so I told him, I said, when you get ready for that message, you let me know and you can tell it. Well, just a few weeks ago, he spoke to one of our Sunday school classes. And since then, he's spoken at other churches, giving his testimony, his message that he needs to tell. So we're going to allow Roger to come this morning and share the message that God has given him to give to you. Roger. Amen. Amen. Can't hide behind that, can you? No. a bigger podium here to hide behind <laughs> I thought we usually sang a couple of songs. And <laughs> but I would like to thank everyone for coming out and for allowing me this opportunity to speak with you. What I want to do is to tell you my story, and it's titled The News. And it's about the day that I got the news that I had cancer. Now, I do realize that sitting, well, first, standing up here is not a lot of fun for me and talking. But I also do realize that sitting out there listening to someone stand up and talk that's a bad speaker. It's not a lot of fun also. But I once heard that wisdom comes through misery. And if that's true, we'll all be a lot wiser. <laughs> <laughs> Let me make a couple of points before we start. First is that I know that I'm not the first person, the last person, or the only person to be told that you have cancer. But I am probably the closest person to me and one of my favorite people. So it has to be. <laughs> It has hit pretty hard. Second point is that this is how I feel about it, and this is my story, and I know that not everyone feels the same about it as I do, but this is some of my thoughts. This story starts back in May of this year. I felt very well. I was riding horses, playing, working. Maybe the kids might not agree that I was working a lot, but I was working. Having cancer was not on my mind. About that time, during the 1st of May there, I started hurting some in my upper abdomen. Nothing severe, but it was there. After a couple of weeks, I went to the family doctor. No answer. He thought possibly a bug, gallbladder. It continued on for a few weeks, so I went to urgent care, the gastro doctor, a couple of visits, and the emergency room, two visits. After the second visit to the emergency room. The doctor was sending me home. I don't think he thought I was sick. I believe he thought I was there for other reasons, whatever. But he was sending me home, and I said to him, why? Where do I go from here? I do hurt. There's something wrong. Well, he reluctantly then agreed to a second CAT scan. He said, we can do a second CAT scan, this time with dye or contrast, and sometimes it shows more. I said, yes, let's do it. His shift ended. He was going home or wherever and told me the next doctor would be in to see me in a little while. A couple hours later, the second doctor came in. He said, I have your CAT scan results back. And I said, good. He said, no, it's not good. Sit down, let's talk. And that's the day that I got the news. He told me that I have a large mass on my pancreas several lesions on my liver, 25 or more lymph nodes that were enlarged. And I said, well, it sounds like you're saying this is cancer. He said, yes, it's cancer. I said, well, I know enough about this to know that it's not good. And he said, no, it's about as bad as it can be. I was admitted to the hospital, King's Daughters, for more testing. And on that day, Sunday, June the 22nd, 2014, I was told that I have, a, have, I have pancreatic cancer, adenocarcinoma, and that I could expect about three weeks to three months to live. Now keep in mind that 12 hours before, I was at a horse show. 24 hours before that, I bought a pair of mules because I wanted mules and a wagon to ride in parades or go on wagon rides. During the next several hours, Nurses and hospital workers were in and out of my room, taking blood pressure, drawing blood, all the fun things they do with needles to stick to you. 
There was one nurse who came in, and I'm sure she could see that I was pretty low when she was talking to me, and I would imagine she was trying to be nice, trying to console me. And she said, well, look at it this way. You at least have time to get your affairs in order. I said, well, ma'am, I've got a lot more affairs than that. It's going to take more than three weeks <laughs> to get everything in order that I want. But I'm sure she meant well. She was meaning to be nice. After more testing and biopsies on Monday, the doctors came in to tell me they were excited. They came in to tell me that after the biopsy, they learned that it was not the typical pancreatic cancer. It was not adenocarcinoma. It was high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma. And this now meant that I had months to live instead of weeks, and we were excited. Now, I'm going to guess if someone told you that you have months to live, you're probably not going to be excited about it. But if you were expecting weeks, then it does get pretty exciting. Everything is relative. Bammy and I now had the terrible job of telling our three kids, parents, brothers, sisters, family, and friends. This was probably the hardest part of this whole ordeal. Then it was off to Houston, Lexington, Ashland, Baltimore, Columbus, chemo, doctor's appointments, blood work, on and on. My life had changed. I'd like to read to you a text conversation with a friend from July the 4th, 12 days after I was diagnosed from Houston. I was in Houston sick and in pain. He, my friend sent to me, good morning, buddy. Hope you have a great day. I sent back right back at him. He said, thank you. I said, what do you hope to do today? Be brief. You'd have to know my friend. <laughs> His response was, in South Shore for a parade, cook out at my house 46, mow my grass, then to Belfont for fireworks. I sent back to him, the reason I asked was to try to help you appreciate life and to keep it in perspective. What I hope to do today is control my pain and possibly have a bowel movement. I don't mean that you don't appreciate life, just a little humor. I hope you have a great day and thanks for keeping in touch. When I got the news, I wasn't given a choice of door number one, door number two, or door number three. I had no say in this. This is what I got. The day I got the news, my life changed. And the day the doctor says to you, sit down, let's talk. Your life will change also. So let me beat the doctor to it and tell you, sit down, let's talk. You're dying and you have a short time to live. Job 14.1 says, man that is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. And how true that is. I understand that more every day. So if you don't understand this, or if you've never been told this, I'm telling you now, change. I recommend that you start living today as if you were told that you are dying soon. Now sometimes you hear people say to live as if you're told you're dying tomorrow. I don't know. I, I don't think we'd live very well if we thought we were living dying, dying tomorrow. That would be too much of a rush. But that you know it's coming. If you wait for the doctor to tell you, I'll bet you will change, and I'll bet you will have regret. There's a song that says, I stand on this mountain, face to the wind, amazed at the number of times I have sinned, and the countless enemies that should have been friends. Here he comes again, my friend. He keeps sending me angels, here they come flying. He, can, he keeps sending me angels, just like you. And boy, is that true. It's been overwhelming how much this community cares and how many prayers have been said for me and my family. And we appreciate every one of them. After I was diagnosed, I feel closer to God than ever before. I feel that he has told me that he wants a few things from me. He wants me to be more loving. I'm working on that. And I'm glad he's patient. He wants, I feel he wants me to tell my story. Bambi and I have told our story locally and to Maine and back. We told it to waiters, waitresses, managers, hotel clerks, sightseers, 
and sometimes innocent bystanders that didn't see it coming. <laughs> Anyone who will listen, and it usually starts with, what's your name, where are you from, sitting on this topic. After my appointment at John Hopkins Medical Center in Baltimore, Maryland, we decided to see the East Coast. So we drove north to Lebec, Maine. Lebec, Maine is the most eastern part of the United States. And if you're on the shoreline, the coastline there, at about 5.30 a.m. in Lebec, Maine, you'll be the first to see the sun up in the United States. Unless you're talking to someone from Cadillac Mountain, and they'll tell you that that part of it is. We like Lebec. And I've done that. They tell me I don't look any different now, but I have done it. I've seen that sun come up. We then went to a little restaurant there in town for blueberry pancakes. Maine's known for his wild blueberries. We met the owner there named Gail and others, and we told our story. He seemed to move Gail. He was a very nice man, about 56 years old, I believe he told me. We went and ran around town for a little while and went back to the restaurant again for lunch. That time we met Melissa, a hippie there. She said she'd been a deadhead, followed the Grateful Dead. She looked like a hippie. She dressed like a hippie. She had hair like a hippie. I guess she was a hippie. But we told her our story also, and it seemed to move her. She was real nice. She gave me a piece of jewelry that I could carry in my pocket. That jewelry her friends had made for her, and it was special to her. She wanted me to have it, so I have it now, and I feel like it's special to me because she gave it to me. But it seemed to move her. She cried, and we were leaving. She didn't hug us, and I was glad. She still needed a bath. <laughs> there were some fishermen in there also. We told them our story. They uh, dove for sea urchins, and I'd never had a sea urchin or knew nothing about them. But they were very nice, seemed to appreciate our story, and they left there while we were eating lunch and went down to the dock and got a couple of sea urchins and brought them back for us to be nice, to bring these raw sea urchins out of the ocean to us to eat. Well, I told them I was on chemo and couldn't eat raw food, and that got me out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but I told them I thought Bambi would love to have one. <laughs> She's still mad at me over there. But they did also seem to appreciate our story, and folks do seem to appreciate being, being made aware that this can happen and that we better be ready. Sometimes we don't have a choice for a say in when or how. The lady at the hospital told me to be thankful for the three weeks and to time to get my affairs in order, and I didn't appreciate that when she said that. I didn't understand. I do now. And I do understand that three, three weeks would mean everything. It, it does allow you some time. And not everyone is going to have three weeks. Sometimes it's a car wreck or a heart attack. So we don't know. After I got the news, I find myself being nicer and more loving to people. And people being nicer and more loving to me. And I think, why? Why do we wait? Why does it take the news to cause us to be nice to each other? We're supposed to before that. Romans 12.10 says, Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. But sometimes I guess it takes something to move us. I think we should try very hard to get along with others and be loving, kind, and peaceful. But I'm not sure that I'm suggesting being tolerant of all the bad around us. I think we should be brave and take a strong stand against the bad and the wrong. How brave and strong? I don't know. You decide that. Romans 12, 18 says, If it be possible, as much as life in you, live peaceably with all men. Believe me, I understand that God is the only one who truly knows what's ahead for me. But I also hear what the doctors are telling me. And I don't think God would want me or expect me to ignore the doctors. And all of my doctors, or most of the doctors, have told me that they know they're not the one in control and they have acknowledged God. Amen. There have been different ones of them pray with me and encourage me to pray about it. And I appreciate that of them. 
But after having been to five hospitals and seen about 12 doctors, not one of them have told me that I'm going to be fine or that I have a hope for a cure. What they do tell me is from diagnosis until, what some of them have told me is that from diagnosis until death, about 12 months. And I've used six months of that already, and it's went by fast. This has caused me to change, but I can't spend my day dreading tomorrow. It will only ruin today. I can't spend my day hoping for tomorrow. It may never come. I live for today and thank the Lord for each day. For every day is a gift from God. How are you spending your time? You may have less than you think. I suggest that you live more, love more, do more, and be more. Learn to live today as if you've received the news. Most of you know the song by Tim McGraw, Live Like You Were Dying. If you haven't heard the song or if you haven't heard it lately, I suggest you listen to it and listen to the words. There is a message in that song. After getting the news, I've thought a lot about my life. What's important, time, change. Whether you realize it or not, we all have an influence on the people around us. Family, friends, co-workers, or whoever. What kind of influence are you having? I hope it's a good one. It is possible that the day will come that you realize you have been all you're going to be, and I hope you've been enough to satisfy you. At that point, you may realize that you're never going to play professional sports, be the governor, or be on TV. You are going to be just you. What became important to me? God, love, family, friends. It became very important for me to see my family and friends saved. I think that possibly, I think that since being diagnosed that I'm possibly a better person and a better Christian. But I can't stand here and tell you that I'm glad I got cancer. I can tell you that you don't have to wait to get cancer to be a better person or a better Christian. Amen. Change. Get closer to God. Get your affairs and life in order. Get your finances in order. Don't die and leave your family unable to pay for your funeral. I'm a funeral <laughs> What would I like on my tombstone? He lived 40 years after being diagnosed. Amen. To kind of wrap up my medical situation, I haven't given up. Amen. On July the 2nd, Dr. Desari in Houston told me that the aggressive chemo that he was offering me to extend my time a little bit was going to make me very sick. I'd have all kinds of problems with it and be wearing a mask and lots of complications. I chose to have that aggressive chemo. I did have it. And that was not the case. I had good quality of life. Uh, it's, it's been wonderful. And I thank the Lord for that and you all for all of your prayers about that. Some doctors have told me about 12 months. Others have told me possibly a year and a half, two years, and some have told me they don't know that it's possible we could have new things come about, better treatments. So we continue to pray and absolutely not give up. Either way, we try to put it in God's hands and we pray about it a lot. Sometimes people ask me for my thoughts or advice on life or dying. I wish I had some great words of wisdom. I don't. Good luck in trying to figure it all out and trust in the Lord. Thank you. Amen. Famous words are what? Get up and fight. Is that what it is? Wake, Wake up, up and fight. fight. Amen. 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 Certainly, I hope that you heard what he was saying this morning. The thing about it is that he made the statement that we're not to wait until something happens to us to get closer to God. 